It's been years since it awakened inside of me. A voice calling for answers, calling for a change in the hierarchy of the DC universe. I've traveled miles, searching for answers, like if he will be the world's savior or destroyer. I still don't know. Am I going mad? My memories are lost in a storm of bad CG and egotistical executive decisions. All I know is his time is nearly upon us. This month we are talking about Black Adam, a film which released in 2022 that has really been controlling my life for almost two years. This film set out to bring a new era for DC, with Dwayne The Rock Johnson leading the charge. However, it didn't turn out to be the case, as instead, not long after Black Adam's theatrical release, DC saw a full change in leadership with James Gunn and Peter Safran, which in my eyes is a much better future for DC than whatever would have happened with The Rock and Black Adam at the forefront. And I want to explain why that is by going into what would have been the debut for this new DC universe, Black Adam. For context on the making of the movie, The Rock had been trying to play the character of Black Adam since 2007, with Peter Siegel originally lined up to direct. Apparently the original idea was always for Black Adam to be a sort of anti-hero figure, but in the original screenplay he would have been going up against the character's nemesis, Captain Marvel, or now Shazam after Marvel laid claim to that name. However, this soon changed in the creative process, as according to producer Hiram Garcia, they wanted to tell both stories with more freedom. Quote, they needed their respective tones that were just a little bit more uh, proposed for those characters. We wanted Shazam to have that younger family vibe to it, but we wanted to have the freedom with Black Adam to really go edgy and a bit darker and a bit more violent. In my opinion, those two tones can work together. Look at Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man film from 2002. You had Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, which was that family vibe, that funny, quirky character that was delivering jokes, but then on the other hand, you also had Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin, which was scary and dark and violent and all of those things, and they still worked so well together, almost because of that tonal divide. In my opinion, this was more due to the fact that after 2007, the Rock became a much bigger star in Hollywood, and therefore it would have been his decision, instead of being the villain in Shazam's movie, be the star of his own movie, and then let Shazam have his own film that's separate entirely. Which is why Shazam released in 2017 without any inclusion of Johnson's character, and work on the standalone Black Adam continued separately. Production was set to begin after work on Johnson's Jungle Cruise movie had finished, with director Harmon Colicera and cinematographer for reshoots Lawrence Scher coming in to continue working with Johnson on this film. Then the world kind of ended. <laughs> Filming was actually set to begin in the summer of 2020 under tight restrictions. However, The Rock had tested positive for COVID, delaying the film's production until early 2021. Another year rolls by with an initial release date of July 2022, then again being delayed to October so that the VFX team had more time to cook. Which honestly, I do respect for them allowing them to do. Crunch is never good, and it is still possible that the VFX team were crunched in those three months, but who's to say? And then, after 15 years, Black Adam Adam finally released in the day of our Lord, October 21st, 2022. And the world was never the same. The film begins with exposition. Nice. We get narration that explains the history of Kandak, a fictional country in the DC universe and where Black Adam comes from in the comics. Kandak was a thriving civilization where people and knowledge were free until the tyrannical King Arkton came with his army and took over Kandak. He came because he wanted to build the crown of Sabak using a turning... Uh, oh, oh, no. Hey, I see you turning off the video. Stop it. Stop it. Look, this isn't boring. Okay, okay, one second. Unktan enslaved the population of Kandak to mine Eternium, a priceless mineral only found in Kandak. Using it, he would build the crown of Sabak, which he would unleash the power of the six demons of the underworld in order to, I don't know, rule the world? And, uh, yeah, let me just check. We're less than two minutes in. Okay, you ready? Here we go. The people of Kandak, like I said, were enslaved to mine Eternium. We see this guy finds a chunk of it and goes over to the guard and gives it to him, asking for a reward from the king. And the guard just does this. 
Like, what the hell, man? Just give him, like, a gold coin or a golden coin maker or something. Why kill him anyway? Just say no, get out of here or anything. I don't know. The guard then turns to the child who is implied to be Black Adam until his father, who is definitely not Dwayne Johnson, shows up and speak nothing like Dwayne Johnson. Not strange at all that the father's face is not shown whatsoever. I'm sure that's unrelated. The kid steals the attorney and back from the guard in defiance of the king, and when he's about to be killed for this, he's magically transported to the Council of Wizards. The wizards, one of which we have seen in Shazam, give him the power of the six Egyptian gods, and as their champion, he kills the King Ankhton. After this, the crown was hidden by the wizards, and the champion is never seen from again, with no real explanation. We cut to present day, where Kandark is now under the rule of Intergang. Not much is really ever told to us about them, other than they're foreign invaders, and they have some cool hover bikes, which is good for them. We see this random kid give a speech to one of them that would make any politician quake in their boots. You are is a new imperialist enforcer from halfway around the world, sent here to steal my country's natural resources, strip mine our sacred lands, pollute our water, oppress our heritage, and make us wait in line. The kid turns out to be distracting the intergang soldier from this van that is smuggling his mother across the city. This is Isis, played by Sarah Shahi. Her and three others are trying to find the crown of Sabak and get it out of the country so that no one is able to get the power of Sabak. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if this crown is that difficult to get and no one else but you are looking for it, I would just leave it alone. Especially since if someone who, I don't know, wants the power of that crown finds out somebody is looking for it, they might try and team up with you in order to get it for themselves, but what do I know? Isis comes upon a tomb in the mountain where she finds the crown floating in the air. Just as she grabs it, Intergang show up and also after the crown. Their immediate response, therefore, is to shoot at her, which is pretty smart of them. Just before she's about to be shot, however, words magically appear on the floor. She reads them out and says Shazam, causing a massive explosion which releases none other than Black Adam, baby! Oh my god! And maybe it's just me, guys, but... This Black Adam is pretty cool. Immediately, he kills everyone in the room pretty brutally, and we can tell he's invincible because he's in creative mode. <laughs> Isis and her brother are able to escape with the Crown of Spark, watching the whole time as Black Adam destroys the army. I do have to say, they did make sure that the audience was aware that this character was brutal and violent in kills. They really did want to make a point out of it, and it does lean into the edgy side a little bit too much at points, but it is still quite effective. More of the army show up, however, with helicopters, and just when you think Black Adam's done for, we're given this awesome slow-motion montage, which has Paint It Black playing in the background. It's really cool and doesn't destroy the pacing at all, and it really makes The Rock seem like a badass. Just when we thought it was over, he's shot with a rocket made of Eternium and is hurt badly. Oh no, his one weakness. We cut back to the tomb where it's revealed that Ishmael, this guy, has been leading Intergang all along. Gasp. This is a thing the film does a lot. There are maybe three or four, maybe even five twists that it attempts to shock the audience with, but they're all extremely predictable or just don't make sense or both. And it just gets really annoying after a while. After this though, the film introduces us to the Justice Society of America, or as they say in this film, the Justice Society. These guys are a smaller scale superhero team to the Justice League. And part of this team in the film is Hawkman, the leader, Dr. Fate, the best character, Cyclone, the quirky girl, and and Atom Smasher, just the guy from the Netflix rom-com. Cool. Anyway, the JSA have been tasked with finding Black Adam and detaining him so that Amanda Waller can keep him imprisoned. Now, at this point, I don't know if you've already realised, but the film is going extremely fast, and already I feel a lot of people would be overwhelmed by the pacing, especially since we keep cutting between all these different characters and all these different introductions, none of which are really developed all that much. I think what's holding it back even more are all of these twists that the film tries to set up and then make time to execute, when really they just add more confusion, making those twists feel like padding more than anything. So, we cut back to Black Adam and he wakes up in the bedroom of the kid that we saw earlier. He has a nightmare and waking up he shoots a lightning bolt at Superman, hinting at this conflict that will definitely surmount to something in the future for sure, right? Right? Anyway, the kid states that he knows who Black Adam is, and he goes, You're Teth Adam, right? What? What the hell is a Teth Adam? Hold on, let me check this out. No. 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 Yeah, where's where's this guy getting Teth from? 
Yeah. Well, hopefully that'll be sorted out soon. I mean, it's not like they would leave the main character's name as a bit to drop at the end of the film, or even worse, not even say it and just let the title card answer after a forced question like, so what do we call you anyways? That's totally not going to happen, right? Right? That's totally what's going to happen. Isis returns home and, uh... Wait, what? <laughs> she still lives in her flat? She's aware that Intergang is coming after her and want to detain her, yet she still goes to the flat where she lives at and presumably has her name in. How stupid is this woman and how stupid is Intergang for not checking on this woman's address? <laughs> so anyway, Black Adam dips. <laughs> I, I find this funny, the film does it a lot, but he just flies out where, whenever, like, when people are just talking. He just leaves, he just goes, it's great. He flies towards a statue built in his honour, and we see him think back to his past, looking awfully sad. As this is happening, the kid just catches up to him. He just skateboarded his way across the entire city at the same speed as Black Adam flying, who literally has the speed of Ampu, aka Anubis, aka an actual god. Sure, fine. This same kid, I shouldn't be calling him kid, what's his name? Okay, Amon. Okay, so Amon decides to mess with the intergang soldiers yet again because he seems to have a death wish. So he decides to fuck with this specific intergang soldier by taking his radio and just absolutely trolling them with this line that's so obviously dubbed in. Just when he and Isis are about to be taken, Black Adam arrives just in time and luckily has his ultimate meter fully charged. It's um... We get a bit of unfunny dialogue to break up the action, and then the Justice Society arrive to the scene. And we have our first epic fight scene between the Justice Society and Black Adam. Now, a well-known fact about Dwayne Johnson is that he is contracted in all of his movies to never lose a fight. Now, if you know this going into a film of his, and a fight such as this one takes place, there really is no drama to what you're seeing, and it just becomes a bunch of visual garbage before The Rock ultimately wins. So whilst the visuals and cinematography in this scene are impressive for the most part, it just isn't a suspenseful fight. And I will say there are moments here where the CG is a little bit is a little bit shonky, and I don't like the comparison of video game-like, because, you know, video games look incredible now, but the CG does become quite noticeable. After all of this, though, Black Adam wins because, like I say, he has to, and then just dips again. <laughs> After this, Isis and Hawkman are talking, and he tells us that Black Adam didn't liberate Kandak 5,000 years ago. In fact, it was his rage that nearly destroyed the entire city. We get a flashback of this and Black Adam killing all but one of the wizards until being imprisoned. I want to take the time here to just briefly talk about the music. It's clear that they were trying to make a badass soundtrack that would be as iconic as Elfman's Spider-Man or Williams' Superman themes, but it just comes off as generic. I can't tell what it is, but something feels familiar, like it's a theme too similar to a bunch of others that it becomes extremely forgettable. And just an extra side note, the use of the non-score music, including Paint It Black for that slow motion montage, it all just feels so disorganised, much like the entire film and the management of DC before James Gunn came in and really just saved the whole thing. I am so excited for Superman Legacy and the future of the DCU and whatever James Gunn is cooking with Peter Safran. Honestly, it's going to be great, but well, that's, that's a larger topic for the conclusion. We'll get to that, we'll get to that. We cut over to Armon, who has the crown and is returning to the flat only to find Ishmael, who reveals his obvious betrayal and shoots Isis's brother Karim and runs after the crown. Armon is is able to escape through a tunnel and call his mother, telling him what's gone on. Black Adam, in a moment of conflict, agrees to fly over and save Armand. So, this is what Black Adam does. He saves Armand. And then, he just dips again. <laughs> and guess what? Armand is captured again. Like, dude, you had him. You saved him. You could have just gone away. But no, he had to be Black Adam and he had to be cool and he had to be Dwayne The Rock Johnson and he had to kill all those guys. And then, Armand gets captured again. You idiot. <laughs> From here we get a big chase with Black Adam and the Justice Society now working together, flying over to catch Armon in one of those hover bikes. But oh no, he isn't in any of them. In fact, he was tucked away inside of this van and not a single member of the Justice Society and Black Adam, all of which who have superpowers, which include super speed, super vision, and you know, just, you know, basic intelligence you'd suspect. No, 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 they didn't see it. But anyway, to figure out where Armand was taken, Black Adam takes two intergang soldiers for a super cool interrogation, which 
really just feels like The Rock trying to go on a power trip. Like, some of the dialogue here and, like, overall the setting of it just randomly flying up into this lightning storm, which just happens to be above them in Egypt, of all places. Of course it does, of course. Black Adam's violent methods lead to another fight with Hawkman, which really is just a whole load of nothing, apart from a couple funny bits with Dr. Fate, like, jumping out and teleporting out of the way. But then they find the crown of Sabak hidden in Armand's room, and they remember that there is also a plot to this movie that they do need to follow. Also, so I'll say this, the crown is hidden behind the secret tunnel Armand uses to escape, which Ishmael was literally right next to. This was so dangerous of Armand to do. If he was gonna hide the crown here, hide it in the tunnel, which he knows no adult figure is able to get into, then can come back and get the crown. Why put it in the exact place that Armand is so close to that he could literally just look down or look in his peripheral vision and find it. It's so stupid. But anyway, now on the ship, they head towards where Ishmael has taken Armand, this mining facility of some sort. Deciphering the writings on the crown, it reads, life is the only path to death, which really doesn't mean anything, and the film points this out. Dr. Fate then confides in Hawkman that someone is going to die. Dr. Fate is able to see into the future, that's some of his powers. We get a few cuts in this flash forward, and I have a big problem with this, and a couple of these shots that I will explain later. As they approach the mine, Hawkman goes on a long ramble about their plan, saying a load of nothing, really. It just goes in one ear and out the other. Then this is just interrupted by Black Adam, simply dipping again. He just flies away and kills everyone down there. I will admit, I did genuinely like this bit. Black Adam really is just anyone who has a social battery after it goes down and just just dips just goes leaves <laughs> But similar with the music choice, this whole scene is a little bit out of place, but it doesn't add anything really, except for Black Adam doing destruction, that's it. Like, there's no real aftermath. Ishmael doesn't even seem that discouraged that all of his facility, his land has been destroyed or his people have been killed. That's it. It's just a Mortal Kombat cutscene that then goes back into the actual main thing. It is just filler. Finally, meeting with Ishmael and Armand, Isis agrees to give him the crown in exchange. However, Ishmael, after unlocking the shield, goes to shoot Armand, with Black Adam going at super speed to kill him. Don't worry though, the villain isn't being too much of an idiot, you'll see. Black Adam explodes with rage, literally, and in doing so hurts Armand badly. Distraught, he returns to the ruins and gives us this final exposition dump. You see, it turns out that the kid from the beginning wasn't Black Adam, and it's actually the father that is Black Adam. I'm sure most people realise that the dad was played by Dwayne Johnson, but just thought it was a strange casting choice at first. Anyway, Black Adam's son was the first champion of the Wizards, was saving Kondak until King Unkton killed his mother and left Black Adam, sorry, Teth, gravely wounded. As a last resort, the son passes the powers onto the father to save him, but in doing so is killed immediately. Bruh. The timing of that is just extremely comical. I don't know why they choreographed it that way, where it's just immediately BAM! Arrow. After this, Black Adam storms the Capitol building, not that one, and kills Ankhan in a fit of rage. Now realising the danger he truly poses, Black Adam says Shazam, and we've got a very silly looking CG skinny rock, who is then sent to be imprisoned, unable to speak, or move. As this happens, however, the body of Ishmael awakens. As it turns out, what the crown was actually reading was death is the only path to life, which is equally convoluted if you ask me. And yet another pointless twist in the story that is just really just doesn't add anything. So, Ishmael had to die in order for the Crown of Sabak to activate and give power. We get some bad CGI hell representation, sort of hoping Doom Guy to pop out of here somewhere in the corner. Dr. Fate foresees this as his visions do not change, and I just want to take the time now to appreciate the greatness that is Pierce Brosnan. He's such an incredible actor in everything, but he really does save this film with the limited screen time that he has. He's still able to create a memorable character out of what little he was given here. He's not even the main character, but he really, really should be. Then Sabark rises and heads straight for Kandak. You can tell he's the opposite of Black Adam, because where Black Adam tends to just dip and exit a scene, Sabak just pulls up out of nowhere. Also, if you couldn't tell, he is CG. He is very CG. In fact, I'd go so far as to say he's bad CG, but I guess that's just my hot take. Get, he's in hell. There, he's from hell. Hot. A fight breaks out between the Justice Society and Sabak. It leaves much to be desired. Again, it just feels like more filler. However, we do get this really cheesy line from Hawkman where he says, That's for my cruiser. Which is very original indeed. I mean, Hawkman has this a lot I haven't mentioned, but Hawkman has so many just basic 
fringe action hero lines, and he doesn't really have much of a character except he's the action hero guy. So Buck heads towards the throne, which is in the ruins, which will make him even more powerful, I guess. I don't know, they never really explain that, but to stop the death of Hawkman, Dr. Fate locks himself in the ruins with Sabak and leaves the Justice Society outside to save them. This scene in particular is really quite funny because it's so clear the director didn't tell Pierce Brosnan where to look and, you know, Pierce Brosnan shot on a different day because he looks completely in the wrong direction to the rest of the cast. He isn't even looking in their general direction, he's just looking way above them. <laughs> hilarious. Then we get a full-blown CGI 1v1 with Dr. Fate fighting Sabak whilst at the same time breaking Black Adam out of prison. And again, this whole scene just proves that Dr. Fate is the best character of the film. He even says the line. You have the power to be the destroyer of this world, but you can also be its savior. He did it. He said the thing. Oh, baby, that's what I've been waiting for. Woo! Okay, but I will say, one thing I don't like, they try to do the Iron Man thing where they show Pierce Brosnan's face under the helmet, and I hate it so much because every show or movie has been doing it lately. Even Halo series with the Master Chief, it's so dumb. Then, just as the Justice Society arrive, Dr. Fate is killed, and this is about where I switch off from the film. Surprising it took this long, I know. But yeah, Sabak sits in the chair, sky beam, zombies, and then Black Adam says the thing. Shazam. He arrives back in Kandak and goes face to face with Sabak, whose voice is, well, very strange. Let the fate of Kandak be decided by the true battle of champions. Let the fate of Kandak be decided by the true battle of champions. Oh my god. Hawkman then uses the magic of the Doctor Fate helmet to trick Sabak into stabbing him. Now, this is stupid because this shot is what Doctor Fate sees in the future, see? However, Dr. Fate even says himself he cannot see past his own death, so why can he see this? And don't tell me it was because he saw a different timeline where Hawkman does die before Dr. Fate dies, because it's the exact same shot. It is the exact same shot of the thing that Hawkman choreographed to be killed by while well, using the helm. I, it, it's so... It, I hate it. <laughs> but yeah, so there's a lot of punching and CG until eventually Sabak dies. Yeah, so out of all the boring final acts of superhero films, this has got to be one of the worst up there with Quantumania. Hawkman gets another cringy line in saying, Never thought I'd be happy to see you. Because of course. Then Dwayne gets another money shot in the pointless little pose because his ego simply isn't boosted enough. Black Adam promises to be the protector of Kandark instead of its leader and abandons the name of Teth Adam. And oh, no, no, don't, don't do it, don't do it. So what should we call you? Then the infamous end credit scene, the one that caused more controversy than it really should have. Amanda Waller makes a threat to Black Adam by sending people not from Earth, and just as she says this, Henry Cavill's Superman returns. And listen, this got a lot of people excited. It got me excited. I wanted Henry Cavill back as Superman, but would this be the kind of return for the character that you want? Where they play the Christopher Reeves theme for nostalgia points and put him against Black Adam just so that The Rock can stay in charge of DC? No, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't respect the character. It doesn't respect the source material. And I'll say it now, if Black Adam was the future of DC, then it would have been a much darker future that would most likely have been abandoned like Snyder's vision or Whedon's vision, even Johnson's anyway, because James Gunn took charge. And that is the the story of Black Adam, a saviour and a destroyer. Because whilst the film did cripple Warner Brothers, it meant an entire reset creatively, with a new, fully fleshed out plan for the future of DC. So, what have we learned? Uh, well, not, not really anything, <laughs> but it was fun to talk about the film. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment, all that lovely stuff, and next month I will be talking about some other pointless trash in pop culture. Thanks guys, bye bye.